Thank you for joining me as I continue my examination of the book On Guard by William Lane Craig. In this video, we will cover chapter seven, which is titled, What About Suffering? So, having, he says, presented several powerful arguments for the existence of God, Craig now turns to respond to some of the arguments against the existence of God. Actually, he only really responds or attempts to respond to one argument against the existence of God. He claims that there really aren't very many arguments against the existence of God. But then again, that causes me to ask, how many arguments are there against the existence of leprechauns? And if I can only think of one or two, does that mean it's reasonable to assume leprechauns exist? We'll get into this a bit more as we work our way through this chapter, but that's really not how any of this works. Just Let's just assume I couldn't think of any good arguments against the existence of leprechauns. Does that mean that it's reasonable to assume leprechauns exist? I don't think it does. Anyway, uh, Craig writes that the arguments for God's existence are so strong, and he's talking about the arguments he's presented in the book so far, the, uh, the cosmological argument, the, the moral argument, the argument from design. He said, these arguments are so strong, and the arguments against God's existence are so few and weak that most non-believers are reduced to simply insisting that their position is the correct one. Quote, Sometimes it seems as if non-believers are deaf. They've been taught to repeat there's no evidence for God's existence like a mantra, apparently believing that saying it again and again somehow makes it true. It's really a cover for intellectual laziness and lack of engagement. It's just a way of saying, I'm not convinced by your arguments. Why well, project much? Bill, can I call you Bill? Um, but if they're not convinced by your arguments for God's existence, would it not make sense from their perspective to say that there is no evidence for God's existence? If you show someone footprints that you say are from Bigfoot and they say, I don't think those are actually from Bigfoot, I think they are faked, there's no actual evidence for Bigfoot, it doesn't make sense for you to keep saying, but what about the footprints? From the perspective of the person you're trying to convince, the footprints don't count, there is no evidence. So you can't keep pointing at the evidence that they have determined is, is fake or false or invalid. Craig takes a few pages to instruct his readers on how to respond when non-believers reject their arguments. He advises getting them to focus on specific premises of the argument that they reject. He also says that having a few arguments for the existence of God and being able to defend them will invalidate the non-believer's claim that there is no evidence for God. No, it won't. If the footprints are hoaxes, then they don't count as evidence for Bigfoot. Of course, Bigfoot tracks aren't a very good analogy for what Craig has done in the book so far, because up to this point, he hasn't pointed toward any physical evidence at all. He's merely made a series of easily refuted philosophical arguments for why God must exist, not described evidence which suggests that God does exist. But, Craig writes, even if there were no evidence for God whatsoever, imagine that, that wouldn't be proof that God doesn't exist. Absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. Quite correct. Though absence of evidence is not evidence of existence either. If there is no evidence that a thing exists, does it make sense to assert that the thing exists because no one can offer positive evidence that it doesn't exist? And how would one do that anyway? What kind of positive evidence could you show to a committed believer that would persuade them that the thing they believe in, despite the absence of evidence for its existence, doesn't exist? If evidence didn't convince them that it does exist, how will evidence convince them that it doesn't exist? There's a reason why the scientific method doesn't operate by attempting to prove negative propositions. I don't disbelieve in leprechauns because someone showed me compelling evidence that they don't exist. I disbelieve in leprechauns because I've never seen compelling evidence that they do exist. If we approached unanswered questions 
the way Craig proposes we approach the question of God's existence, then we could never have confidence we knew the truth about anything. Because anyone can propose a possible answer to the question that can't be definitively disproved. Abraham Lincoln helped to build my house. Can you prove he didn't? If not, I'm justified in believing it. I have no evidence that Abraham Lincoln had anything to do with the building of my house, but anyone who seriously expects me to accept that he didn't help to build it had better have some damn good evidence that he didn't build it, or else I'm going to go right on believing that he did. Craig addresses the objection that his demand that non-believers prove God doesn't exist is unreasonable. He says, quote, very often, atheists themselves admit that they have no evidence of God's absence, but they try to put a different spin on it. They'll tell you no one can prove a universal negative, like there is no God. They think this somehow excuses them from needing evidence against God's existence. But not only is it false that you can't prove a universal negative, all you have to do is show something is self-contradictory, but more importantly, this claim is really an admission that it's impossible to prove atheism. Atheism involves a universal negative. You can't prove a universal negative, therefore atheism is unprovable. Well, most atheists I'm familiar with, including myself, would agree that atheism can't be proven to a 100% philosophical certainty. We aren't atheists because we're fully convinced that there is no God and nothing, no argument, no evidence could ever change our minds. We're atheists because we don't believe gods exist, and for most of us, the reason we don't believe gods exist is that we've not seen any good reasons to believe that gods do exist. Or, to put it another way, since, as we're about to see, Craig doesn't like it when atheists define their atheism as a lack of belief in gods. Atheists such as myself have concluded, confidently but provisionally, that it is far, far more likely that gods do not exist than that gods do exist. Therefore, we don't assume that they exist. Note how blatantly Craig is shifting the burden of proof here, and if you think this is blatant, whew, you ain't seen nothing yet, but he is shifting the burden of proof. He not only insists that atheists must have evidence to prove that God doesn't exist, but he presents himself as the reasonable one in this scenario. He is making this grandiose and, despite his best efforts, totally unsubstantiated claim that God exists. And now he is demanding that people who dispute his claim prove his claim isn't true. Remember how Remember also how often Craig has tried to pull this trick in the previous chapters of this book. He acknowledges objections to his argument that God was, say, the first cause of the universe. But then he says that still doesn't prove God didn't do it. He acknowledges objections to his argument that the universe is designed for the purpose of supporting life. But then he says, but even if that objection were true, it still doesn't prove God didn't design it this way. He retreats time and time again to shifting the burden of proof, which effectively renders his arguments unfalsifiable. Because even if he acknowledges that a fatal objection that has the power to invalidate his entire argument might be true, he follows that up with, but it still doesn't prove that I'm wrong. It's as if someone says to him, you know, you haven't proven you're right. And he responds with, well, you haven't proven I'm wrong either, so I must be right. Now, about defining atheism as a lack of belief, Craig really doesn't like that. He complains that it's a bad definition, that it's ahistorical, meaning that is not what atheists have traditionally meant by atheism, and that it doesn't describe a position or a worldview, but simply a psychological state. Why, according to that definition, even Craig's cat is an atheist. Right. And? 
As long as the person using that definition of atheism makes it clear that's the sense in which they're using the word, I don't see the problem with that definition. If the person using the definition of atheism in that way is trying to equivocate and cause confusion between uh, a more historical, traditional, formal definition of atheism and atheism meaning a lack of belief, then I could see where there might be some objection from people in Craig's camp. But as long as the person defining atheism as simply a lack of belief in gods is up front and clear in their use of the term in that sense, I don't see what his problem with it could possibly be. Go find someone who defines their atheism another way to argue with. If that's if none of your arguments work against people who define their atheism as a lack of belief, then go find someone who defines it another way and argue with them. <laughs> the person you're trying to argue with is under no obligation to define their position in a way that makes it easier for you to argue against. I think I see Craig's problem with it, though. If he accepts that atheism can mean a lack of belief in gods, then that makes atheism, when used in that sense, the default position. Craig would have to start from a point of non-belief and find reasons and evidence to justify his taking a position that asserted the existence of gods, and of his god in particular. He doesn't want to do that because his strategy involves shifting the burden of proof from the person making the claim, him, to the people disputing the claim, non-believers. It's not his job to convince us that what he's saying is true. It's our job to convince him that what he's saying is false. And not only is he shifting the burden of proof to us, He's raising that burden, he's raising that standard of proof to an unattainable level so that if there is even a tiny possibility remaining that what he's saying is true, he's going to continue to insist that it is true because we haven't yet proven it wasn't. But all of that is not to say there are no arguments against the existence of God. Craig admits that there is one, the problem of suffering which isn't an argument against the existence of God at all, but at most an argument against the benevolence of God. But Craig has defined God in such a rigid way that his God is the personification of benevolence, the ultimate source of all benevolence. So if you're going to say that God can't be good, you might as well say God can't exist according to William Lane Craig. So he treats this as an argument regarding the existence of God for the rest of the chapter, so that's how I'll treat it as well. But I have always felt that the argument was much better understood as an argument against either the omnipotence or the goodness rather than necessarily the existence of God. Well, Craig divides the problem of suffering into an intellectual problem and an emotional problem. The intellectual problem questions if it's reasonable to believe God exists in a world where suffering occurs, and the emotional problem deals with the dislike or the discomfort people feel for a God who permits suffering. Craig believes that it's actually mostly the emotional problem that causes people to doubt or reject the existence of God due to the suffering that occurs in the world. People want nothing to do with a God who would allow suffering to occur while having the power to prevent it. As for the intellectual problem, Craig says, quote, Now, in discussing the intellectual problem of suffering, it's important that we keep in mind who has the burden of proof here. We're considering arguments for atheism. We want to hear from the atheist some arguments against God. So now it's the atheist who must shoulder the burden of proof. It's up to him to give us an argument leading to the conclusion, therefore God does not exist. So yeah, he's being quite blatant about his shifting the burden of proof here. Craig goes on to say that atheists demanding explanations from believers while having nothing to while, while having to prove nothing themselves is a clever debating strategy but philosophically illegitimate and intellectually dishonest yep that's what he said i love how his justification for shifting the burden of proof is well it's their turn now as if that's how any of this works Okay, I just gave you all my evidence that Stephen King shot John Lennon, so now it's your turn to give me all your evidence that Stephen King didn't shoot him, and if you can't convince me, then I win. 
seems fair, doesn't it? That's how an honest emotional or that, an honest intellectual scientific discourse should be conducted, don't you think? You just take turns. It's eeny, meeny, miny, mo. I'll go, then you go, and then if you can't beat me on your go, then I automatically win. That's how, that's how, that's how it works, right? And note how Craig has framed the argument in his preferred terms. Despite the fact that many atheists do not claim to know for certain that God does not exist and do not attempt to present arguments that lead to the conclusion, therefore God does not exist, and do not see any need for such arguments to validate their position, Craig is setting this up so that atheism necessarily means a claim that God does not exist, which must be supported by an argument leading to the conclusion that God does not exist. And by the way, there are actually philosophical arguments that conclude that God doesn't exist. Some of them are pretty good. Most of them have nothing to do with the existence of suffering. Craig does not address or even acknowledge the existence of any of them. And I'm not saying that such, that such arguments don't exist or can't exist or that they can't be of use. I am saying that Craig doesn't mention them at all. And he is not only shifting the burden of proof, but framing the argument in a way that benefits him, which means ignoring those philosophical arguments uh, in favor of the proposition God does not exist, and demanding that people he is arguing with disprove a claim that he has failed to prove in the first place, or else he wins by default. Craig addresses two versions of the intellectual problem of suffering. First is a logical argument, the claim that it's logically impossible for God and suffering to coexist. And this argument relies on the assumptions that God is all-powerful and that since God is also all-loving, he would prefer a world without suffering. Craig responds that even God would not be able to do things that are logically impossible. For example, God could not make a circle a square because by definition that's impossible. You can't have a circle that is a square. It just doesn't work. It's a logical contradiction. God could not force someone to do something freely because again, those two concepts are completely contradictory. If you're forcing someone to do something, they're not doing it freely. If they're doing it freely, then they aren't being forced. And since people have free will, they have the ability to refuse to do what God wants them to do. God could not create a world that has both the possibility of free will and an absence of suffering. Therefore, the assumption that God can create any world he wants is fallacious. Craig also attacks the validity of God preferring a world without suffering on the same basis. Perhaps God has good reasons for permitting suffering, or perhaps God's preferred world without suffering is impossible because of the existence of free will. Craig rejects this logical version of the problem of suffering by appealing to free will. Suffering is not inconsistent with an all-powerful and all-good God if we assume that God created a world that has the maximum amount of good and the minimum amount of suffering possible given free will, where the suffering that God does permit is allowed for good reasons. But is God's commitment to free will as absolute as Craig seems to require it to be for the purposes of his argument? The Bible contains several instances where God is depicted as hardening a person's heart to stop them from believing a certain thing or taking a certain action, or lifting the scales from a person's eyes to allow them to see a truth that they had been blind to. Also, most Christian depictions of heaven present it as a place on earth. No, I'm kidding. Present it as a place without suffering, or evil. So either God abandons his commitment to free will in favor of eliminating suffering and evil in heaven, or heaven is a place where nothing ever happens. Or heaven is a place where free will can exist in the absence of suffering. Either option seems to invalidate Craig's argument that God cannot prevent all suffering because of free will. This just does not seem to be the case. 
Craig also totally ignores the existence of suffering that results from natural disasters or other causes having nothing to do with the ability of humans to make free choices. Surely, even if he were bound by some absolute respect for human free will, God could at least eliminate these natural causes of suffering. And yet he doesn't. The second intellectual form of the problem of evil states that it is improbable that God exists given the suffering in the world. Surely a good, all-powerful God would be eager to reduce the suffering in the world and able to do so without reducing also the goodness in the world. Craig's response is that we can't judge whether or not God has good reasons for permitting suffering. We don't know what God knows, so suffering that looks unjustified to us might be perfectly justified from where God sits. Short-term catastrophes can and often do result in long-term benefits that act to reduce suffering. We don't always know what the long-term benefits of events will be, but God does. Also, even if God's existence is improbable relative to the existence of suffering, it doesn't matter because Craig has shown God's existence is very probable through other arguments. So once again, sorry, checkmate, I win. <sighs> also, also, Christianity provides a framework wherein the existence of suffering under the eye of an all-powerful and loving God makes sense. Christianity teaches that the purpose of life is to know God, that humanity is in a state of rebellion against God, that God's purpose reaches beyond this mortal life and into eternity, and that knowledge of God is an immeasurable good that renders all suffering insignificant by comparison. And he goes on to say, quote, The atheist may respond at this point that we have no reason to think that these four Christian doctrines are true. Whoa! He's trying to shift the burden of proof again. It's the atheist who claims that suffering makes God's existence improbable. It's entirely legitimate for you to say, not the Christian God. Actually, it is the Christian God that the existence of suffering makes improbable because Christians insist that their God is all-powerful and all-loving, and the existence of suffering would tend to contradict one or both of those qualities belonging to God. Anyway, according to Craig, as long as it's limited to the context of arguments about the existence of suffering, it's sufficient to simply propose a scenario where it would make sense for God and suffering to coexist. And here's the thing. It's fine to do that. I've done that several times in this series so far. Craig makes a sweeping statement. I propose a hypothetical scenario that may not be true, but could be true, where that universal statement that Craig just made doesn't apply. The problem is, I don't think Craig actually proposes a scenario here where it would make sense for a loving God and suffering to coexist. I don't think the Christian worldview as described by Craig, as championed by Craig, is such a scenario where the coexistence of an all-powerful, all-loving God and suffering are compatible. What he proposes is a scenario where we are essentially forbidden to question whether God is right to permit suffering to, ex to exist. Craig doesn't propose a scenario where the suffering people experience in the world is unavoidable, even by God, or where suffering is necessary to serve some greater good in the long run, and he certainly doesn't define what such a greater good would be or why the existence of suffering is necessary to attain that greater good. He simply proposes a scenario where the God who allows the suffering has also declared that the purpose of life is to know Him that suffering caused by humans is our fault, not his, because of our rebellion against him, and that he can't be blamed for any suffering we experience on earth anyway, because people who know him will experience joy that will cancel out the suffering. There are a lot of holes there. The first hole is that God doesn't actually tell us any of this. He leaves it to us to infer and piece it together 
on the basis of unreliable purported divine revelations, revelations which are often contradicted by revelations from other purported prophets, if God made it known to all of us in a clear and easily understandable way, which is surely within his power to do, he is God, why suffering was necessary, it would probably be easier to accept. In Craig's description of the Christian framework, God also blames humans for the suffering we cause, abdicating, abdicating, pardon me, abdicating his own responsibility for allowing it because we have rebelled against him. So we humans, who are largely ignorant of God's expectations of us, which is God's fault because he never made them clear, and are powerless against God's omnipotence, are told that it's our fault. While the God who has the power to end all our suffering in an instant stands back and declares himself to be blameless. The argument that the everlasting joy of knowing God in eternity will cancel out the suffering we experience during our earthly lives is troubling for two reasons. First, God has the power to alleviate the suffering of everyone, but he doesn't. Even if he makes up for it later, or tries to make up for it later, he is still allowing people to suffer unnecessarily. Unless God proposes to go back in time and erase those things that happened, they will always have suffered unnecessarily in a way that God could have prevented but didn't. True, sometimes suffering can be made up for by later actions. If a child suffers through a difficult visit to the dentist, a parent may be able to cancel out that suffering with a trip to the ice cream parlor. But the suffering the child went through still happened. The visit to the ice cream parlor doesn't erase the suffering. It still happened. But because the suffering was for a greater good, and because the parent did not have the power to prevent the suffering without also preventing the good that resulted from it, taking the child to get the ice cream or offering some other form of reward is the best the parent can do to acknowledge to the child that they respect the fact that they suffered and that they care enough about them to want to help them feel better. That is not at all the situation between humans and God. Unlike human parents, God does have the power to make the visit to the dentist's office free from suffering. And even if for some reason he doesn't, he hasn't even bothered to explain to us why the suffering is necessary and what benefit we will gain from enduring it, which is something most parents faced with a child nervous about an upcoming dentist appointment would do. Most damaging of all to the God makes up for our suffering later with eternal bliss argument is the fact that within most forms of Christianity, God does not provide eternal bliss to everyone. In fact, most people who live and die do not go to heaven. They go somewhere else. And whether hell is interpreted to be a place of literal fire and torment or a place merely where the unsaved are eternally separated from God and their saved loved ones, it is clearly a place of suffering. And it is a place God created. Within Craig's Christian framework, most people who ever live will not only suffer to varying degrees during their mortal lives, but also suffer in the afterlife for all eternity. How does the eternal bliss of a relative few cancel out the eternal suffering of the many? Motorcycles, they're just burbling cauldrons of global warming, aren't they? Um, before ending the chapter, Craig turns to address the emotional problem of suffering, which he believes is the form of the problem that affects the most people. So how does Craig suggest his readers deal with people who reject God on an emotional basis due to the problem of suffering? Quote, the most important thing may be just to be there as a loving friend and sympathetic listener. But some people may need counsel, and we ourselves may need to deal with this problem when we suffer. 
Does the Christian faith also have the resources to deal with this problem as well? It certainly does, for it tells us that God is not a distant creator or impersonal ground of being, but a loving Father who shares our sufferings and hurts with us. And Craig, of course, immediately cites the example of Jesus, who suffered on the cross for the sins of the world. The only thing I can say in response to this is bullshit. Even if I grant Craig that Jesus was God incarnate, and that through his death on the cross, God truly suffered. Hell, even if I grant that God suffers alongside every single person who ever suffers, there is a major difference between the suffering of a human being and the suffering of God. That difference is power. God will always be God. God will always be in control. God will always be safe. God will always survive. God will always know what happens next. God will never be powerless. God will never have a reason to be afraid. God will never experience pain and wonder if the pain will last until he dies. God will never be confused. God will never fail to understand why he is suffering. I've been hungry before, but that doesn't mean I understand the suffering of starving people. I've been broke before, but that doesn't mean I understand the suffering of people living in deep, inescapable poverty. I can't be privileged and truly understand the suffering of the underprivileged, not without completely giving up my privilege, with no hope or plan or expectation of getting it back. I can ask someone to waterboard me, and I'm sure I will suffer as a result of that experience, but I will never share the suffering of a prisoner who has been tortured unless I have truly been one myself. My voluntary waterboarding experience might give me insight into that prisoner's suffering, insight that I wouldn't have otherwise, but it would be arrogant vanity to assume that it allowed me to truly understand the prisoner's suffering. It is arrogant vanity for a person who has always had all the power to ever assume they understand the suffering of a person with no power. An omnipotent God who claims he shares the suffering of humans is not to be trusted. And neither is a human who uses that claim to try and sell that God to you. That's it for chapter 7. In the next video of this series, we will take a look at chapter 8, which is titled, Who Was Jesus? That'll be fun, right? We just keep rolling through William Lane Craig's greatest hits. Next up, Who Was Jesus? That's in the next video. Thank you all for watching this video. I so, so, so very much appreciate your attention and your interest. As always, if you have something to say in response to something I have had to say in this video, please do let me know in the comments if you think I got something right, if you think I got something wrong, if you agree, if you disagree, if you are a fellow atheist, if you are a Christian of some stripe or another, or if you are some other category of believer or non-believer entirely, I would be very interested to hear in, uh, hear what you have had to say in response to what I have had to say here. And I also want to remind you, as I always do, if these videos I make, both this series and the other videos that I do, uh, are of some worth to you, please consider helping me to continue making them by supporting this channel through Patreon. You can go to patreon.com slash Steve Shives to become a patron of this channel for as little as $1 a month. And those $1 a month pledges help me out like you would not believe. But if you can afford to pledge $5 a month or higher, you can take advantage of some extra perks in the Patreon campaign that I have set up, including getting a sneak peek at the scripts for these Atheist Reads videos, which I post the day before the videos go live on YouTube. So you can check out the script before you actually see the video, have it in front of you to follow along with, uh, or... Do whatever you want to do with it. Um, I, I know that some of you who are patrons of mine who have taken advantage of the scripts find them really useful and, and appreciate having them. So I'm glad that that 
perk is something that people enjoy and, and get some use out of. So anyway, whether you are a patron or thinking of becoming a patron or not, thank you so very much for watching and thank you for your support in whatever form it has come. And I will see you next time.